Hello folks. In this video, I want to cover the difference between primary and secondary sources. Uh, I'll also describe examples of primary and secondary source materials, and uh, I will also briefly review where you may want to look for primary and secondary source materials. For starters, let's talk about what a primary source is not. A common misconception I see students having about primary sources is that they think it's a journal article, book, or a chapter that they're using for their research project that they think is the most important or most relevant to their topic. However, this is an incorrect definition of a primary source. In academic research in the humanities and social sciences, articles, books, theses, and dissertations, these are not primary sources. Those are secondary sources. So what then are primary sources? I like the following definition of primary sources from Furman University, which I will also link in the description box below. Uh, as they state here, quote, primary sources are firsthand contemporary accounts of events created by individuals during that period of time or several years later, such as correspondence, diaries, memoirs, and personal histories. These original records can be found in several media, such as print, artwork, and audio and visual recording. Examples of primary sources include manuscripts, newspapers, speeches, cartoons, photographs, video, and artifacts. Primary sources can be described as those sources that are the closest, that are closest to the origin of the information. They contain raw information and thus must be interpreted by researchers. Okay, uh, so next I want to cover some examples of these uh, that are mentioned in this slide. And I'm also gonna be throwing in other examples that I feel are also relevant. But before I continue going on with some of these examples, I wanna talk about, okay, so where can you go to look for primary sources in the first place? Now, uh, for most of us, right, uh, our, most of our university libraries have databases where we actually can search for primary source materials. I would strongly suggest that you investigate that uh, on your own time uh, to figure out what the university libraries, um, what their methods and procedures are. Uh, other things to keep in mind is that uh, universities uh, often have their own archives where they keep historical documents. Uh, so just as an example here at Cal State Northridge, uh, Cal State Northridge has their own special collections and archives department. The same goes for Arizona State University, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Okay, so I just wanted to emphasize that if you're in case in case you wanted to look at primary source documents held locally at your university, you can schedule something with the archivist. Other things to look out for is that sometimes university libraries they might have digital collections of whatever it is that uh, whatever documents they have in-house. So if like let's say if you wanted to do research but you don't want to go to campus. Uh, maybe you could search their digital collections. So for example, uh, this is uh, from Cal State Northridge's webpage. Okay, so they, here they describe uh, digital collections that they, can, that they have, you know, including documents, photographs, oral histories, uh, etc. Um, and outside of the university archives, of course, you can explore and go see what other archives uh, are out there outside of the university that house historical documents. You know, so for example, I'm just thinking here in Los Angeles, for example, um, a very accessible archive I've been able to go to locally here is by uh, the USC area. Um, and I think it's the Southern California Library. Uh, and so anyways, the idea is here is that depending on what documents you're trying to look for, um, you know, maybe one thing you might want to investigate is if there's a local archival repository close to you where you might want to go do uh, uh, research. But if that's not uh, the way you want to go, you might also want to consider looking at uh, digital archival materials. So for example, Library of Congress website, or perhaps um, I also have a database that I'm sharing with the, the students in my Chicano, Chicano, Chicano Studies courses to look for uh, primary source materials that are that have been digitized. I'll actually also include that in the, in the description below of this video. Uh, another thing you might want to consider is uh, if you don't want to go to a physical archive, um, uh, or uh, if you don't feel like looking at what's out there digitally, another option is to look at published primary sources. So these are sources that have been uh, transcribed uh, from the original document and it was put into book format. And in some cases they've been put into article format. Uh, so a classic example uh, in US history uh, is the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. There's also the option, of course, of citing museum artifacts as your primary sources, depending on what your topic is. And another thing, right, uh, that you might want to consider is doing a Google search uh, to get a sense of what is out there. Depending on what your topic is, I may not have tips, right, for where you might be able to look for primary sources immediately. 
Uh, I might have ideas, but uh, again, you'll probably you will definitely have to do some research on your own, perhaps outside of the university library databases. Maybe look at Google, see if maybe there's some digitized primary sources relating to your specific topic. Uh, so in this set slide, you can see an example of some of these uh, primary source databases that I've listed, that I've collected thanks to the help of many colleagues and thanks to Twitter historians who ad helped uh, add to my list here. Uh, but uh, just to get you a sense of the types of digital documents that you can find out there, you know, I know that many of these are relevant to Chicana, Chicana, uh, Chicano, Chicanx history and also uh, Mexican and Mex uh, Mexican history and uh, Latinx history. Th regardless of what your topic is, you might find something similar uh, relevant to your field. So, for example, here in some of the sources that you see listed, you could see, for example, there's oral history repositories such as the Bracero Oral History Project. Uh, at uh, UTEP here that's listed on the left side. Okay, so what is a secondary source? Let's go back to Furman University. Uh, here they state uh, in that same page that I had shared earlier that secondary sources are closely related to primary sources and often interpret them. These sources are documents that relate to information that originated elsewhere. Secondary sources often use generalizations, analysis, interpretations, and synthesis of primary sources. Examples of secondary sources include textbooks, articles, and reference books. Now, I want to emphasize that in academia, we ask for scholarly peer-reviewed secondary sources. And so this includes journal articles, books, textbooks, book chapters, master's thesis, uh, theses, I should say, and dissertations. Uh, for some classes that I have that are not strictly history courses, I do allow exceptions to this rule. But for all of my history-related courses, I do ask for all of your secondary sources to be scholarly peer-reviewed sources. Before continuing, I want to clarify what does not constitute a scholarly or peer-reviewed source. Uh, for starters, right, newspaper articles that offer contemporary perspectives or opinions on past events, right, these are not secondary sources that are scholarly or peer-reviewed might be secondary, but it's not scholarly, not peer-reviewed. The same goes for articles from CNN, Fox News, or any other media station. Uh, blogs or opinion pieces, another example of uh, sources that are secondary, but they are not scholarly, not peer-reviewed. Uh, for that matter, all web articles, blog posts, newspapers, or sources from .com websites, these are not scholarly, secondary, peer-reviewed sources. Uh, there's some examples where newspapers are, are primary sources, yes, uh, they're not, not scholarly peer-reviewed secondary sources. Some common examples I've seen in many of my classes is folks using examples from history.com, uh, you know, or from Bremescla, uh, or the Zen History Project. Again, while they do have some articles that might relate to our disciplines, right? Uh, again, these are not scholarly peer-reviewed sources. As uh, my girl Cardi B says, it's not a reliable source. So what makes a, a secondary source scholarly and peer-reviewed? When we say that a source is peer reviewed, it means that it's likely gone through some sort of a peer review process among other academics or publishers. And usually these are works that are published in an academic journal or published by a university press. So for example, uh, some journals I'm thinking about are the Journal of American History, for example, the Journal of Ethno History, uh, the University of Texas Press, University of California Press. Uh, and uh, as we have pictured here, right, some examples of these journals are the International Labor uh, and working class uh, history journal or the Journal of Asian American Studies. Uh, and so granted, there are exceptions to this rule, right? Uh, where sometimes you have scholarly rigorous work uh, outside of uh, what's mentioned here. Uh, but the point here is, is that you your work should have uh, some scholarly rigor. And that brings me to this next question. So what makes the source academic? Uh, so usually these uh, refer to sources or articles, right, that are written by academics, or this is work that's published by an academic press. So as you see here, these, uh, these two journals, right, um, uh, this one, the International Labor and Working Class History, that's uh, hosted by Cambridge University Press, uh, for example. These works, they have credibility because they went through this peer review process. And granted, not all the books that we typically use in academia are always written by academics. Uh, and they're not always published by academic presses. Uh, but the point here is that, that you are using sources that are written by someone who is reliable. Uh, we're hoping that you're not going to, for example, uh, cite a work that's written by someone who is claiming that aliens from outer space uh, were responsible for the entire outcome of historical events uh, in the world, okay? 
Another way to decipher uh, whether or not a source is academic, think about if uh, this source, think about who the audience is. If it's a magazine article from National Geographic or Forbes magazine, um, those are uh, articles that are usually written for general audiences. These are not uh, articles that are written for uh, academics or uh, researchers. So in that case, right, if you come across an, a reading like that, the chances are that it's not an academic or peer-reviewed source. So again, I want to cover what is considered a scholarly peer-reviewed source. I often have folks that will confuse magazines, web articles, or newspaper reports as peer-reviewed scholarly sources. So again, um, I know I sound like a broken record here, but these are not scholarly peer-reviewed sources since they are not meant for academic audiences. Oops, not a reliable source. So uh, what is an, uh, in the scholarly peer-reviewed sense? Uh, the University of New England Library website describes that, quote, uh, these peer-reviewed scholarly sources that are research articles published in scholarly journals. A research article is a report on original research written by the researchers with an audience of other researchers in mind. This is how experts in academic fields report their findings to one another and build knowledge based on previous research. So how can you tell if your journal is scholarly? You can follow the steps that are mentioned here to investigate if a journal is peer-reviewed, but I don't want to take too much time explaining that process here, and I don't want you all to spend too much time doing this either. My simple answer is instead of doing this process that's mentioned here on this slide, just use, uh, just limit your database search to only peer-reviewed journal articles only. And you can do this using the university library's uh, search databases. You know, and you can use them to easily tell if a source is peer reviewed or not. Uh, so, for example, uh, most universities now are using the OneSearch tool. So, for example, here, this is uh, the OneSearch for uh, one of the other institutions I work for, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, as you can see, you can also help narrow down your search terms here on this navigation pane to the left. Uh, you can look at specifically just peer-reviewed scholarly sources by just checking that checkbox there. And you can also even narrow it down by books. Uh, you can also check the box for articles. You can check the box for book chapters and theses and dissertations. So where can you go to find scholarly peer-reviewed sources, right? So I mentioned one search just now. Uh, another thing that I do want to point out is that you can also sometimes find entire digital versions of books uh, on one search as well. Uh, and um, you can also, of course, look for scholarly peer-reviewed sources in your university library. Uh, pretty much everything that's in the university library it will count, right? Um, another thing you might want to use if you haven't considered this yet uh, is Google Scholar. And the reason why I like to push Google Scholar uh, to many of my students is that this has happened to me, for example, where I, I'm looking for a source and I'm using search terms on, on OneSearch and um, I get more sources on Google Scholar than I do uh, on OneSearch sometimes. So what I like to do sometimes is, uh, let's say if I'm on Google Scholar and I find an article name that I didn't find uh, on OneSearch. So sometimes what I like to do is copy and paste the name of the article or book that I found on Google Scholar and I'll type it into OneSearch. And almost always, sure enough, it does pop up. Uh, and if it's not there, uh, I will use the interlibrary loan system uh, by the university library to request the book or article. Uh, and usually interlibrary loan does give you, they will uh, provide the text for you in most cases. Okay, and if you're requesting an article or book chapter, uh, chances are that they might be able to send it to you electronically, okay, instead of you having to have a physical copy uh, of that source. Another tip that I have on scholarly peer-reviewed sources uh, is that you might also want to consider some of the assigned readings that maybe were already covered in class or in your, some of your other previous classes. Uh, so for example, I personally, I do allow students to use uh, the assigned readings from our class uh, as part of their research papers. I know every faculty member is different, so uh, that's just for me, but make sure that you check in with your professors on their policies regarding that. Um, you might even want to include an article that you've read for a different class that maybe relates to your research paper. Uh, so again, uh, that's just something to consider. Think about maybe uh, scholarly sources that you already read and are just sort of recycling or implementing for this paper. Now, another unsung source here that I do like to preach to my students is archive.org. I cannot tell you how many times I've found entire books and sometimes primary sources 
on archive.org. Uh, the cool thing about archive.org is that you can get digital access to books that are uh, sometimes out of print or whose copyright expired long a long time ago. Uh, so take advantage of this, if, especially if you're trying to look at older books and if you want to get a sense of how um, uh, academics or scholars right, have uh, interpreted certain historical events uh, in earlier time periods. Uh, and so, uh, and honestly, I, I will say I have even encountered primary sources on here. So again, you know, think about this as a possible resource, right? I, I found primary source readers on archive.org uh, as well.